Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'ala habita fillah Continuing on in our study of Bulugh al-Maram uh, Chapter 4 The Bab al-Walima The chapter of the wedding feast uh, We reach the second hadith the hadith of uh, Ibn Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in ala sahabat rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in this hadith narrated Ibn Umar radiyallahu ta'ala an Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said when one of you is invited to a wedding feast he must attend it mutafqun alayhi agreed upon a Muslim has when one of you invites his brother he must respond whether it is a wedding feast or something similar. In this hadith, it clarifies us the importance of the wanima and that it is an obligation upon the one who is invited to attend the invitation. And this is from this hadith as well as other ahadith which illustrate that this is an obligation. However, some of the ulama say that it is mustahab. So the scholars do uh, differ. However, some of the scholars, according to this, and as well as other evidence, deduce that this is an obligation. And that's what this hadith uh, illustrates for us. As the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا دُعِيَ أَحَدُكُمْ إِلَى الْوَلِيمَةِ so that the one who is invited to the walima, then he must attend or he should attend. And so this is in the imperative form, meaning that it is a, an, an order from the Prophet wasallam, and we've talked about it uh, prior to this, that whenever there is an amr in the sharia, a command in the sharia, the asal of that command, the origin of that command, is that it is an obligation. Al-Amr, you feed al-wujub. Uh, a command shows that something is an obligation. In relation to that hadith, uh, there are many uh, benefits and many important things that we can learn. And one of the important things that... Uh, uh, scholars like Imam bin Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned regarding this hadith and explaining this hadith is that the hadith or uh, that when it comes to attending the walima there are some important things to consider. For example, if it is a walima in which it is uh, there's going to be muharram, there's going to be mixing dancing, singing, all kind of things. As we see in this day and age, we find that there's a lot of munkarat in a lot of the wedding celebrations amongst the believers. And a lot of taqlid and following the disbelievers with their ceremonies. Everything from dress to doing munkarat, like uh, mixing and singing and dancing. I mean, dancing like real music, rap music, whatever kind of music, but all kind of uh, making it like a big party which is going uh, outside the Sharia bo uh, bounds from uh, those things which are already permissible. They, it's going and transgressing beyond the bounds. So due to this fact, it's important, one important thing that Ben Othaymin mentions, and that is if someone invites you to the wedding, that this fits the ahkam khamsa the five different rulings regarding uh, regarding uh, the five different ahkam uh, uh, rulings. For example, it can be to where it is muharram to attend. For example, the situation we mentioned where there's mixing men and women like, like as if they're dating and dancing as if it's at a nightclub. Uh, and music and sometimes even alcohol or just all kind of activities which are impermissible for a Muslim to be a part of and witness. So in that case, it will be Muharram 
to attend. Likewise, it could be makru, where it is if the activities that are taking place are disliked there, but they're not haram, but it's actually uh, bordering on sin or leading to sinfulness, then in that situation, it would be makru to attend. Al wasail laha ahkam al maqasid. One of the Sharia principles is that the ruling of the means for something, or the rulings uh, of the the means of something, is the same as its ends. The ends takes the same ruling as the means. So meaning that if you have a haram means or that this activity is haram, then the end will be unjustified. It will not be a halal end. Even if the an, the end result is that it's supposedly supposed to be a halal activity. So for example, in the walima, that is a walima of, of munkarat, if the means of celebrating this righteous ceremony, this bonding together of the husband and wife, is Muharram, then that makes that attending that Walima Muharram. And likewise, if the means is Makru, then it makes attending that uh, Walima Makru. And if it is Muba, it's permissible, then of course it is permissible to attend. And then the other Ahkam, which would be where it is uh, recommended or uh, you know, recommended or mashroor, where it's legislated, meaning it's according to the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, then a person must uh, attend that unless they have a legitimate excuse, a, a great hardship, and they seek permission uh, uh, to not attend from the one who has invited them. So that's very important, uh, a very important thing to consider with regards to the obligation of the walima. Uh, another important point is that if the place is a place of munkar, if it is a place uh, where, for example, there's music or there's this, uh, then as we mentioned, it would be impermissible to attend unless someone fits certain criterion, meaning that they have the ability to change the munkar. They have the ability... They go for the sake of dawa and to remove the sinfulness, to remove the sinfulness, the harmfulness. For example, if a person, uh, and you know, especially it you know, could be a greater pressure to attend it uh, if it's your, your close relative and you know that there's going to be muharramat there, but you have knowledge and the, uh, the intention of actually, you know, making this uh, an opportunity for dawah and calling them to khair and calling them uh, and to removing the munkar, that they actually respect you enough to where, yes, they will actually turn off the music or whatever the case may be, that you can have a positive effect uh, from the point of dawah and removing the munkar, then in this situation, uh, some of the ulama, they say, then it will be permissible to attend because you have the ability to change that munkar. And this goes in accordance with the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who said, Man ra'a minkum munkarin falyughayru biyad fa'in lam yistati' fa bi lisanihi fa'in lam yistati' fa bi qalbihi wa thalika adaw fa liman. Ruahu Muslim. So it's a hadith in Sahih Muslim, the hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu ta'ala who said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, whoever sees a munkar then uh, change it with his hands. If he's unable to do so, then change it with his tongue, speak out against it. And then if he's unable to do so, then change it with his heart, meaning to hate it. And that is the weakest form of faith. Letting us know all those things are in the maratib of, uh, of, of iman and faith. They are the levels of iman and faith. And they are different ways in which a person is, uh, can uh, remove munkar. Or at least dislike the munkar in their heart. So... This lets us know that in this situation, that if a person has that ability, then yes, then in that situation, they should attend and, and do so. And, you know, call in the people back to the good. Uh, another important uh, point.
point is again, this is built upon maslaha. This is built upon uh, the harms and the benefits, looking at the harms and the benefits. And the greater benefit would be dawa and removing the munkar. But if a person feels that they will not have this effect and there's very little chances that people will listen to them and that they will actually be affected, then of course they should not attend those gatherings. Uh, likewise, a walima, if one is going to attend and there's doubt, uh, there's uh, a situation where the, the money for the walima is muharram, is haram, then it should also be avoided. Meaning, for example, you know for sure that the person who is hosting the walima, they stole the sheep and the meat that they were going to have. So that is clearly that they stole this meat uh, and so you know you would be eating and participating in that uh, that haram right there. So in that case, that would be uh, impermissible in that situation to attend. Uh, those are some of the main benefits of that hadith. In the next hadith, uh, uh, Anabi, uh, uh, narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the worst kind of food is that at a wedding feast from which those who come meaning the poor are turned away and to which those who refuse to come meaning the rich are invited if anyone does not accept an invitation he is disobeyed Allah and his Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this hadith, there are immense benefits and fawa'id. From amongst those uh, benefits is that if there is a walima and the wealthy are invited and they leave off the poor, okay, uh, then the Prophet Sallallahu described it as some of the worst food, that this is, that this is a, a bad uh, a, a situation and, and wedding feast because uh, part of the intention is to feed those who are in need during this happy celebration uh, and this happy occasion. So then the question arises, uh, the one who does this, are they sinful or not? Uh, if there is uh, you know, poor people who have a great need, you know, for this, and they're excluded, then in this situation, uh, Ben Rathameen mentions that it would be uh, the person who fails to invite them uh, is has incurred a sin. But other than that, then there would be no sin. Meaning if they invited wealthy people, it wasn't deliberately just to invite wealthy people, but that was mainly the people they knew and they didn't really have the opportunity to reach out to others who were poor, then in this situation, uh, it would not, they would not incur a sin. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that it is an obligation, uh, as we mentioned, to accept the in invitation of the walima. And this is because the Prophet wasallam said, whoever uh, does not accept or come to this invitation then they have disobeyed Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam so that shows us that it's a very serious thing that it is a type of disobedience of Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam because that's what the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam informed us so it shows us that it's very important uh, at least and in the situation is what seems to be the apparent meaning of this text and others that it is an obligation because there wouldn't be the threat of punishment or the threat of being disobedient to Allah and His Messenger because we know that disobedience uh, incurs a sin. So this uh, is strong evidence to support the state of the uh, the opinion of the ulama who say that the walima is an obligation that it is wajib. Another benefit of this hadith is that we learn that a command of the Prophet وسلم, is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning that there's tawfiq there, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed the Messenger وسلم, to deliver the message of Islam. He received the revelation, 
and Allah ordered us to obey him and that disobedience to him is disobedience to Allah. So there's a link in that uh, command there. And this is in accordance in this hadith, uh, in accordance with the statement, فَقَدْ عَسَى Allah wa rasuluhu. Then they have disobeyed Allah and his messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that it is permissible to make a comparison when it comes to the hukum, come to the to rulings uh, between uh, uh, or mentioning you know Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, uh, "Fakad asa Allah wa rasuluhu." Then they have he has disobeyed Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you find all throughout uh, the Quran and the Sunnah, the Prophet uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "Fi kitab al kareem." Uh, obey Allah, and that's a command, and obey His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has commanded us, letting us know that obedience to Allah, uh, obedience to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is obedience to Allah. And by disobeying the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we are disobeying Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And likewise, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has commanded it. And whenever we have a command, we know that the asal of that command is that it is an obligation. So there's many ayat and ahadith which illustrate that hukum and that comparison. But what we have to understand is that comparison does not have anything to do with ibadah as far as the Prophet wasallam sharing in rububiyah, the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or any divinity. The Prophet wasallam was not divine. The Prophet wasallam was a man he was the greatest of mankind. He was the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was beloved uh, by Allah subhanahu wa taala as being a prophet, and as all the prophets and him after salatu wasalam were. And uh, but they are they were not they are not to be worshipped, and they do not have divinity. Alayhim after salatu wasalam. So it's very important to understand that principle because this is where some of the extreme groups go astray and they uh, give the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they attribute to him uh, lordship, which is a major uh, mistake and is shirk. It is uh, from the major shirk. Wallahu musta'an. Uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Wa Allaha wa Rasul. Wa Rasul. Uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Imran, verse 132, Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, uh, obey Allah and obey his messenger and obey the messenger. Uh, and this is in Surah An Nisa, verse 59. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An Nisa, verse, four, verse 14, wa and whoever uh, disobeys Allah and his messenger. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this link between. Uh, obeying his messenger and obeying him. That disobeying the messenger is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that we know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that brings a, another last important point, And that is the conditions for our deeds to be accepted. What makes up ibadah? What makes up worship? Which is one of the most important questions we need to know and 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 related to all this thick that we're, we're gaining from Balugh Amaram and our other studies is these two very important principles and the first is ikhlas that when you uh, worship you worship Allah alone and your worship is sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you pray it's to Allah when you make dua it's to Allah when you dhabh, you know, uh, sacrifice a, a sheep or a lamb or a goat or a camel or a, a cow it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Bismillah, in the name of Allah. Not in the name of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not in the name of Jesus alayhi salatu wa salam. Not in the name of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam. Or Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam. But in the name of Allah azza wa jal. The creator of the heavens and earth. And the creator of Jibreel and Muhammad. And all the messengers alayhim after salatu wa salam. Uh, so, very important. 
that we we have that understanding so that's the first condition the second condition for having our deeds accepted and making it a, a sincere uh, a, a legitimate act of worship in Islam uh, and that includes the walima and includes every act of ibadah when you're doing it to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and aside from ikhlas it is mutaba' meaning you're following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu you're following how he did it how did he worship Allah how did he make hajj how did he make umrah how did he pray how did he supplicate what words did he use uh, following his sunnah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and those are some of the main benefits of this hadith in the next hadith, narrated Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, When one of you is invited to a meal, he must accept. If he is fasting, he should pray, meaning make supplication for him. And if he is not fasting, he should eat. Muslim reported it as well. Muslim has something similar to the above hadith. From the hadith of Jabr radiallahu ta'ala'an and it goes if he wishes he may eat and if he wishes he may leave meaning leave the food alone in this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala'an in regards to the walima in regards to partaking in the walima. This hadith shows us uh, is also further evidence, as we mentioned, that some of the ulama mentioned of the obligation of attending the walima. And this is one of those hadith from its apparent meaning, which illustrates this. And that's because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Fil Yujib. He said, then it is uh, an obligation to attend. <clears throat> he said, when one of you is invited, he must accept. Okay, so that, that portion of the hadith, that ibarah from the Prophet ﷺ, uh, shows us or indicates in its apparent meaning that it is an obligation to attend these types of gatherings. However, most of the ulama, jamhur, the majority, uh, say that as far as other gatherings, uh, aside from the walima, that it is sunnah, that it is not, uh, that it is um, uh, recommended to attend, but is not an obligation. But as far as the um, the uh, the Walima, the, as the Walima is concerned, a lot of the evidence uh, points that it is an obligation to uh, attend that, uh, that invitation. And the person who doesn't incurs a sin, according to that, uh, that view. And the only way, as we mentioned prior to this, that a person can get out of that sin is if they ask for... Uh, to be excused by the person who has invited them, the married couple or whoever has invited them. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows that uh, it indicates also that the person fasting, that they are also obliged to come to this uh, wedding ceremony if they are invited. That if they have been invited, then they should attend as well. As the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, فَإِنْ كَانَ صَائِمًا فَلْيُسَلِّ وَإِنْ كَانَ مُفْتَرًا فَلْيُتْعِمْ يُتْعَمْ The Prophet ﷺ said, so therefore, if uh, the person is fasting, meaning the one who's been invited to the, uh, to the uh, walima, then they should uh, salli. And salli here, the prayer does not mean the uh, the common salat that we're used to, uh, either of two units of prayer, rakatain, or four units of prayer, or for the maghrib, uh, three units of prayer, 
but rather this salat here is in uh, this salat here is in reference to du'a, is in refer reference to supplicating, and that meaning that the fasting person is not obliged to necessarily break their fast, but they should attend this walima, and during this walima, that they can. Uh, instead of, since they're not partaking in food, then they can supplicate. And it shows us the, how it, Islam is so inclusive um, and inclusive in ibadah, that all of these things are about worship. The reason we accept this invitation, it's actually, uh, aside from sharing in that happy moment for the couple, but it's also an act of ibadah. It shows us that it's also an act of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's also an act of of Tawheed, of uh, directing all of our worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the means that are mashru' by the means that are legislated in accordance with the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this hadith shows us how inclusive Islam, how inclusive ibadah is. That ibadah is not something restricted as in other faiths, not restricted to just um, just what we consider supplication, but rather the Muslim uh, has various means of ibadah from something as simple as attending a walima, uh, you know, this wedding celebration, or smiling. This is a type of charity. And this is, as the Prophet Wasallam said, uh, joining the prayer of one of your Muslim brothers who wants to pray in jama'ah and has missed the jama'ah. This is a type of sadaqah, as the Prophet Wasallam said. And so this shows us that all of these are rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are all acts of ibadah. So this hadith also illustrates for us how Islam is so inclusive that even the person fasting, who is fasting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fasting in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, already doing an act of worship, and now they're invited to participate in a wedding cer uh, celebration in order to partake in food, that they still should attend as an act of ibadah, only increasing their reward, not taking from them. And however, they supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is an act of ibadah, an act of worship, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, supplicating on behalf of the married couple for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put blessings in their marriage. So it shows us again how uh, complete Islam is and how it's all about worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that the uh, again, as, as we, we just mentioned, these benefits are very linked. Uh, is that the one who is fasting and they do not eat, that they should supplicate. However, so something we want to mention in, in addition, as uh, some of the scholars mentioned, is that if uh, the person sees that leaving off food, that there's harm in this, then it is better to eat, meaning break their fast. Okay? So again, Islam also uh, is always observant of the musalih wa mufasid the harms uh, the benefits and the harms by weighing that so if there is a greater mafsada a greater harm then uh, in the case and there's a greater harm by fasting then uh, it uh then it would be better to break the fast and uh, eat with the other guests. And that could happen in various uh, types of scenarios. However, it's just important to remember uh, and benefit from this hadith uh, that uh, always looking at the harms and the benefits when it comes to especially things which are in reference. It could be something in obligation, but it could also be and especially when it comes to things that are uh, mustahab, when maybe there's more benefit in leaving off this act which is mustahab and recommended, and uh, you know, and doing uh, a, another act of ibadah, you know, 
And one example that comes to mind, not related to this hadith, but also showing this principle, which we got from this hadith, is, as some of the scholars mention, uh, in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, some people they pr they want to pray in their shoes, uh, and following the example of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because in the time of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam, when they would enter the masjid, you know, they didn't have uh, carpets and things like this. The 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 haram was just uh, a dirt floor, so they would. As they entered the masjid, before entering the masjid, they would look to see that there was nothing uh, nudges or filthy upon their shoes. And then they would, uh, and if they found something or anything suspect, they would, you know, wipe their, you know, rub their, uh, their shoes or their sandals on the, on the earth, on the clean earth, before entering the masjid. Okay, and then they would pray in their shoes because that was their state. So some of the scholars, they say, you know, pr uh, praying uh, in, the, in the sandals, that this is also sunnah. So, but however, most of the masajid in the world, there's very few places that allow for a person to pray uh, while in their shoes. So although this is maybe a sunnah, if it is going to cause uh, a greater harm by wearing those sandals, then it would be better to leave off that that uh, sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu for a greater uh, maslaha, a greater benefit for the overall community. In that, for one, if you pray in your shoes in a masjid that has a nice carpet, for one, you're gonna cause damage to the carpet. Number two, another mafsada or harm would be that the people, uh, you know, would be very upset with you and, and, and and maybe want to harm you. They wouldn't accept this. So this would cause fitna in the masjid. Number three, another harm of that is that it would also could be be a type of israf, you know, a kind of wasting of wealth, meaning that the community has spent this money on this nice carpet, and now you've come in abusing the carpet, really giving it a short life because you're wearing your shoes in the carpet and, and whatever comes in with your shoes compared to being barefoot or in socks, which causes little uh, effect, uh, except over a long, long, long term period. So this is a, a another illustration of how um, in Islam, and also derived from this hadith, looking at the harms and the benefits. Another benefit of this particular hadith is that it is also legislated for the one who uh, is um, who is not fasting, of course, is to to partake in the food. So meaning if someone was fasting uh, and then they decided to break their fast or someone else, of course, who attends, that they should eat. They should eat uh, something from the food. Those are the main benefits of this hadith. In the next hadith, narrated uh, uh, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the food of walima on the first day is a duty, that on the second day is a sunnah, while the third day is showing off. Whoever does something to show off, Allah will expose him in the hereafter. Reported by a tirmidhi who graded it as gharib, transmitted through a single narrator, uh, it is incorrectly claimed that its narrators are those who are reported from in uh, Bukhari. Uh, this hadith also has a supporting chain, which is also weak, collected by Ibn Majah on the authority of Anas uh, radiallahu ta'ala'an. So again, uh, as the scholars have mentioned, many of the scholars, that this is a weak uh, narration. And uh, if it were to be uh, a sound narration, some of the benefits that could be derived, as Ben Orthameen mentions, is that uh, the walima on the first day uh, is an obligation. And the first day... Uh, is wajib in accordance with this hadith if it were correct a sound hadith another benefit is that the second day it's sunnah in accordance with this hadith uh, and those are some of the main uh, benefits with regards to this hadith but however as we've mentioned uh, Imam Tirmidhi graded as gharib uh, in the next hadith narrated Safiya 
anha, daughter of Sheba. The Prophet ﷺ held a, wed, a wedding feast for one of his wives with two uh, mud of barley reported by Al-Bukhari. In this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, it illustrates the simplicity of the walima as well. That if someone is unable, uh, as we mentioned prior to this, someone who has has restricted means, then they can uh, you know use something as simple as as the Prophet ﷺ did uh, was uh, uh, two mud of barley and. Uh, that this is equivalent to uh, half of a sa'a uh, and a sa'a is like four uh, hand full so uh, two emdad would be uh, one sa'a if I'm correct so maybe uh, a few handfuls uh, of barley or something to this effect but letting us know again that it was of minimal uh, uh, minimal amount of uh, of food, and that this shows that it's permissible, especially for the one for the person who uh, has uh, who has restricted uh, means, who has uh, very little uh, means. Uh, also from this hadith. Uh, so this hadith illustrates for us that for the one of uh, restricted means that the walima is still correct uh, even if it was less than a sheep as we mentioned uh, prior to this. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us that it is mashroor to have a walima, that it is legislated uh, to have a an Islamic, uh, this Islamic celebration when one has got, uh, one gets married. In the next hadith, narrated uh, Anas radiallahu ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa stayed three nights between Khaybar and Al-Medina when he consummated his marriage with Safiya. I called the Muslims to his wedding feast, uh, which did not include bread or meat. He just ordered some leather dining sheets to be spread and al haste a food made from dates, uh, sun-baked yogurt and butter were thrown on them agreed upon and the wording is al-Bukhari. Uh, in this hadith also it illustrates for us that again that the uh, that uh, if there is a minimal means for the wedding feast that it's permissible with even uh, something uh, less than uh, a sheep. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates for us that it is permissible uh, to uh, that is permissible to uh, have relations, of course, during travel. That's one of the the things uh, that the scholars uh, deduce from this hadith because uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was traveling between. Uh, Khaybar and Medina and he had relations with Safiya anha. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates the importance of having privacy during the if someone is camping or whatever the case may be uh, between the husband and the wife okay that they should have uh, or, or, or the family so that way the woman can observe uh, can be relaxed or and if they're not if they're not in a private sphere then they should observe the hijab and so forth another benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, uh, illustrates for us that from the Sunnah the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not making a difficulty a great difficulty uh, with regards to a walima and the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam made it very simple and the, in this case, they just put the sheet out and uh, provided the, 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 the food, which is a very simple food, uh, known to those people. Uh, another 
benefit of this hadith is uh, this hadith illustrates uh, from the indication of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala that he pointed out or can be deduced, deduced from his uh, statement that it is uh, not permissible to be wasteful with regards to a wanima and in general with anything but it's specifically uh, in this hadith pointing out that one should not be wasteful with regards to having a wanima and this is in relation to his statement min khubz wala lahum. he said uh, and th there wasn't uh, any uh, bread or even uh, meat, letting us know that those were not the most important uh, of items, that it had to be uh, extravagant, but simplicity was sufficient. And not being extravagant is uh, very, very important. An important and an important part of this uh, walima. And in the 899th hadith narrated, companion of the Prophet وسلم, when two people come together to issue an invitation, accept that of the one whose door is nearer to you. However, if one of them comes before the other, accept the invitation of the first, reported by Abu Dawood, its chain of narrators is weak. Uh, again, this is a weak narration, and so there... Uh, since it's not a sound uh, narration, then the uh, the hukum uh, attached to it is not a hukum uh, that is uh, relevant for us. In the next group of hadith, uh, they illustrate some of the mannerisms, uh, although they are contained still in the book of marriage, but they deal with some of the mannerisms of dealing with uh, food uh, and and food during food food gatherings uh, and and ceremonies and that's why uh, these hadith are still in the book of marriage in the chapter of the walima or the wedding uh, celebration uh, in the first hadith the nine hundredth hadith in accordance with my uh, my nusuch or my nuscha, uh, nuscha narrated Abu Juhayfa radiallahu ta'an Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said I do not eat mutaki, mutaki in uh, sitting with the support of something so as to eat more re related by al-Bukhari uh, in the first hadith in this uh, that it, in reference to the adab of eating, the manners with regards to eating, the hadith of Abi Juhayfa, radiallahu uh, ta'an, this illustrates that the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, said because some of the people, perhaps this was the custom of the time, and we find that people still do this, and as an Islamic uh, being Muslims, we should be aware of this, and beware uh, beware this uh, practice stay away from this practice not eat mutaki in meaning to be leaning on something leaning on one's hand or whatever the case may be kind of laying down in the, this kind of posture uh, while eating and the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said uh, mentioned uh, in this hadith he said uh, I do not eat eat mutaki in, uh, and as the the people explain, in order to eat uh, more, as the explainer of the hadith mentioned, that in order to eat more, so perhaps some of the belief, or maybe some of the uh, some of the people would eat in this posture, and it makes it easy for them to be. Uh, wasteful and eat more, ad eat additional food. One of the benefits of this hadith, the fawaid or benefits that we derive, that the scholars derive from this hadith, is that the Prophet ﷺ disliked to eat 
Mutaki in that it is uh, the Prophet ﷺ prohibited this uh, practice and from this statement, from the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, La akulu, uh, I do not uh, eat mutaki in. <clears throat> so this is a prohibition that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that he does not do. So is this a nahi for tahrim or a nahi fi karahiya? You know, is this a prohibition? To show that this is haram, prohibited, or is this a prohibition to show that it is um, that it is disliked? And Ben Othaymin mentioned that because of the way that uh, it was mentioned that in his view, that he held the view that uh, it is uh, disliked. And some of the reasons for that, some of the hikmah behind that, is that the person uh, who eats in this posture uh, may be uh, overindulgent in this practice, in, in eating this food. Uh, And that also it makes it easy for the person to spill and be uh, when the, when they're not in a correct posture or a good eating posture. That it's easy for them to be wasteful and easy for them to waste food on themselves to spill food. Uh, in the next hadith, the hadith uh, uh, narrated Umar ibn Abi Salama radiyallahu ta'ala an. Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to me, Dear child, mention Allah's name, eat with your right hand, and eat from what is next to you, mutafakun uh, alayhi. This is a hadith agreed upon in Bukhari and Muslim. The hadith of Umar ibn Abi Salama, radiallahu ta'ala an. And in this hadith, there are immense benefits. And before talking about those immense benefits, one of the fawaid Ben Uthaymin mentions, one of the benefits that he mentions with regards to uh, hadith that have to do with mannerisms in general. So that includes uh, the hadith we just took to, uh, prior to this. But in general, and when we get to the chapter, uh, the comprehensive chapter in the end of Bulug Amaram, talking about the various uh, adab and manners that he said, in the kuluma kanam in bab al-adab, he said that this is a principle. He said that everything that relates to the manners, then it is mustahab, it is recommended. Unless there is evidence to support that it's an obligation. Unless there is uh, is other evidence from the Quran, from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, to show that those hadith traditions or what have you are uh, uh, related to uh, manners are an obligation. So meaning that there's other evidence from the sunnah to show that that particular adab or mannerism is an obligation. And he said, He said, as for those things which relate to worship, Meaning worship with regards to, uh, you know, show that worse worship in the Sunnah or in the Quran, then those things relate to uh, obligation, lil wujub, until, so it's an opposite principle, hatta yukuma dalila la istahbab, until there is evidence to show that those. Uh, Acts of worship are recommended. So this relates to the Qaeda we've we've spoke about countless times during our study of Bulugh Maram, Al Emr Yufid al Wuju, Wa Nahi Yufid al Tahrim. That whenever there's a command in the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet, 
that the asal of that command is that it's an obligation. Unless there is dalil to show that it is uh, mustahab, that it is, you know, uh, recommended. So, this, uh, and this, this qaida more specifically relates to ta'abud, those things uh, that are related to uh, uh, worship. However, if it's something related to manners, we learn, uh, Ben Uthaymeen highlights this other important qaida that the obligations, the commands that relate to uh, adab or manners, that the asl is, uh, that they are mustahab, that they are recommended unless there's dalil from the sharia to show that they are in obligation. So that's very important. So that uh, deals with a lot of the manners that we are, that we've covered and that we're going to cover in this hadith and in the some of the remaining hadith that we will uh, cover. Uh, so from the benefits of this hadith is it shows us the uh, the humbleness or the humility of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. That he was uh, very humble and that he, he even ate with this young boy, that he wasn't too proud that, no, I can only eat with the adults. I can only eat uh, with so-and-so or so-and-so from the head of tribes or what have you. But the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi was humble and ate with the people. Another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith illustrates for us that it is uh, permissible to uh, address someone who is close to you with a a call to uh, by calling out to them saying oh gulam like the prophet sallallahu said in this hadith ya gulam oh uh, young boy you know and so, although the boy, well, the boy was there, was in his presence, alayhi salatu wasalam. This hadith also shows us the, that it is, uh, it illustrates for us the excellence in teaching of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That he, he uh, uh, you know, the way he addressed the boy, the young boy, showed that, you know, gave the, the boy uh, a type of, you know, addressed him in a way that was uh, worthy and of high esteem. And this also is a learning, uh, which was a, uh, uh, a learning tool for us, or an example for us, which is a, uh, which illustrates the excellence in uh, the Prophet Sallallahu way of teaching, alayhi salatu wasalam. This hadith also shows us that is important to give attention to the young children and not just brush them off. So we learn from this and, and other ahadith that from the proper uh, educative effect and the, pro the proper form of education and manners, mannerisms and uh, ways of dealing with people is that you give the children uh, their due respect and treat them in respectful uh, ways as well and so and that differs with a lot of the un-islamic customs where you see the people treat the children uh, just as as if they're nothing or in a way to belittle them but in fact as a reminder to myself and my brothers and sisters that we should be conscious of this and treat uh, our children and be educated you know be to where we're teaching them which is in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the obligation to make the tasmiyah when eating and that it can be done, as the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam said, uh, Allah, you know, uh, that the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam said, uh, say bismillah, you know, say bismillah, say in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> And from this, uh, you know, from this hadith, this is one of the evidences that uh, for the, uh, the obligation of saying the tesmiya over uh, food. And this is in order to seek barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
and that the the uh, shaitan will not share in the uh, blessings and in the drink and in the food. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that it is an obligation to eat uh, with the right hand as long as a person is absolutely unable a, a, a paid person is absolutely able to eat with their right hand then from the Islamic mannerisms is to eat with the right hand and in and by leaving off eating with the right hand out of laziness that this is Muharram this is Haram this is impermissible so it shows us the obligation to eat with the right hand for the one who is able to do so and that that is a part of the Islamic edib or Islamic mannerisms when it comes to eating another benefit uh, of this hadith is it also shows us that uh, the excellence of eating with the hand that this was from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu that does not however mean that we cannot eat with silverware with forks and spoons and, and so forth and knives but rather from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu illustrating this excellent manner is that uh, we learn that this is uh, that by you know eating with a hand is from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the one who does other than that is is doing khilaf a sunnah but we don't say that this is a bid'ah or that this is uh, muharram another benefit of this hadith which also illustrates islamic manners this hadith illustrates a lot of islamic manners mannerism is uh, to eat from the portion of the plate which is in front of you so from the Islamic mannerisms is to eat that food which is closest to you, not to reach over and reach around and reach all across the, uh, the food when partaking in it. Those are some of the main benefits uh, of this hadith. In the next hadith uh, narrated in Ibn Abbas the Prophet was brought a dish containing th uh, Tharid uh, and said eat from its side and not from the middle for the blessing descends in the middle of it reported by Al-Arba this is the wording of an nisai its chain of narrators is authentic so this is the authentic hadith and in this hadith it shows it illustrates for us the, what we just mentioned and that is to eat uh, is to eat from the sides of the plate and not to necessarily reach across the plate and not to eat from the the uh, and eat from the the middle and the Prophet Sallallahu said said uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said eat from its sides and not from the middle for the blessing descends in the middle of it so letting us know that the food around should be eaten before one is reaching across or going inside the middle of the plate. Uh, narrated Jabir radiallahu ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu said, do not eat with the left hand for the devil eats with the left hand reported by Muslim. In this hadith in Sahih Muslim, this illustrates also the uh, tahrim of uh, eating with the left hand and that the left hand is uh, reserved for uh, that which is, uh, you know, for cleaning oneself and one's private parts and, and so forth. So that one should not eat with the left hand, but rather they should eat with the right hand, which is in accordance with the son of the Prophet Sallallahu And as we mentioned in the hadith prior to this, that it is an obligation. And so that's from the guidance of the Prophet Alayhi Salatu uh, Wasalam. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that the shaitan eats with the left 
and so uh, that the sh- or that the shaitan will uh, will partake in that food, uh, and the shaitan also eats with the left hand. So, in order not to resemble the shaitan, one should avoid eating with the left hand. Uh, narrated Abu Qatada radiallahu ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said when one of you drinks he must not breathe into the vessel mutafakun alayhi agreed upon Abu Dawood reported something similar from Ibn Abbas and he added or blow into it a Tirmidhi graded it as sahih or authentic this hadith also illustrates for us the uh, important Islamic adab or manners when it comes to uh, eating and from the benefits of this hadith, is one of the benefits is it shows the uh, completeness of the Sharia that it includes all aspects of life, even to, uh, down to the manners, mannerisms of food, and even more specifically, even how to deal with, uh, you know, not to resemble the shaitan, uh, going to the restroom, and all kind of uh, things which are part of Islamic mannerism. So this shows the completeness of the Sharia. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is it also shows us the prohibition prohibition of breathing into one's uh, drinking vessel, cup or what have you. And the scholars mention whether it is uh, karaha or it is the tahrim as we mentioned, whether it is disliked or whether it is impermissible. And uh, Ben Uthaymin mentions that it is disliked and not that it's haram unless by breathing in that vessel you are going to spread some sort of sickness or harm to someone else. So in that case where a person is very sick or whatever the case may be that they and they're breathing in the vessel then this would become muharram because you're going to uh, spread that and especially when you are sharing uh, those cups and drinks. So from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and Islamic mannerisms is to avoid this practice of breathing in one's cup but rather drink and then breathe and then drink and breathe but not breathing inside the cup. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that from those manners is to remove the cup from, uh, and that is from the sunnah, that the person who wants to drink or needs to breathe, that they should drink and then they take their breath. Uh, and if they, uh, to drink and then they take their breath. Okay, that that is from the Islamic mannerisms uh, that are illustrated from this hadith. Uh, a last benefit from the uh, the hadith that was uh, in the narration uh, of, of Abu Dawood, uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and, uh, added, or blow into it, meaning that one should not blow into the their drinks to cool it off, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Those are some of the, the important mannerisms, and especially in the chapter, the book of marriage in the Walima, and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم